Good morning. My name is Randall. I'm one of the leaders here at Hub City Church. Uh, I just want to welcome you and thank you for tuning in to our kind of digital Sunday worship guide. I hope this morning finds you well and safe and healthy. Here's what you're going to need to do. You're going to need to grab a Bible. Um, I'll wait for you to grab that Bible. Maybe give me a quick thumbs up when you have it. All right, we got the thumbs up. Here we go. You're going to want to turn that Bible to, to James. Um, what we're going to do this morning is we're going to continue our study through James's letter to us. We're going to be in chapter 2, verses 14 through 19. So let me just begin our time by, by reading this for us here. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or a sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one you do well, even the demons believe that, and shudder. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you this morning for your revealed word to your people. Father, I pray that we would be a people that would be open and receptive through the indwelling of the Spirit in our lives to hear your word this morning, to receive your word, and then would your Spirit work in us to respond to your word in worship and in obedience. We thank you that your gospel is truth to us, that it transforms us, that it shapes us more and more to be mature, to be complete, to be lacking in nothing, and transforms us more every day into the image of your son, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so... This passage that we're looking at today in James is really upheld as probably one of the most confusing passages in all of Scripture. It's also one of those passages that people will point out, like, it just seems like it's contradictory to the gospel. Like, what is James actually saying to us? So we're going to kind of walk through this and unpack some things, and, and we'll see what James is actually going to show us here. Um, James is going to dig into some spaces and he's going to confront some realities in us that at times are hard, difficult, and challenging for us to face. And, and really what he's after is this. He's challenging and confronting us to address in our lives is, is what we say congruent with how we live and act. He's concerned primarily here with Jesus' followers living out and expressing a faith that is genuine and real. And he's asking this question, like, what does that look like? Is, is your faith, maybe not other people's, but is your faith, is it the real article, right? Is it genuine? Is it authentic? That's, that's what he's after here. And he does it in a way that kind of at the front seems confusing or contradictory to the rest of the gospel. So we need to do some work to kind of get to the bottom of what he's saying here. So, so James is going to, through this passage here in these verses, teach us that, that genuine faith, what it means to, to truly believe and follow Jesus is demonstrated not merely by what we say we believe, but how we live out what we say we believe. So there are, there are kind of two words. There's these two broad sections that we're going to look at specifically in verses 14 and 19. And then there's kind of these statements that go with them. So um, what you need to know here is, is that these six verses, they really form the heart of James's letter. And so we're going to look at these in these two broad sections again. Verses 14 through 17, James is getting to this. He's saying, hey, don't, don't just tell me. And then verses 18 through 19, he, he answers that by saying, show me. So, so really you could sum it up by saying, don't just tell me, 
show me. Like that's what James is getting at here. So let's look back again at verse 14 and a few verses that follow and kind of get to the bottom of this. Again, let me just read this. So he poses this question. He says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says, right? So we've got this, this person who says that he has faith, but that faith is not followed anywhere in their life by any sort of action or, or works, okay? Can that faith save him. So James wants to know if an individual comes to you and says like, hey, look at me, or maybe you are that individual. And you say like, I've got this great faith, uh, faith that encompasses trust and belief, but also faith that encompasses like a body of doctrine that I adhere to. Um, so that's two ways that we can kind of look at faith, but, but it doesn't result like in any transformation of my heart, or it doesn't result in any type of action or work on my part. And then James poses this question, well, is that type of faith genuine? Can that type of faith actually save somebody? And then he goes on and gives another case study here. He returns to really the case study that we looked at last week. He says, if a brother or a sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, well, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Okay, so before we launch into this, it's vital to note that James, as he writes this, because he was, has a very like shepherding and pastoral tone throughout all of his letter, right? He's not here to like beat his readers over the head. He has the heart of a shepherd, but in that he realizes that a heart of a shepherd also is going to ask penetrating questions, in some cases, very biting questions. So another thing to pay attention to as we kind of dig into this is James is not teaching us how to be saved by doing good works. And so James would uphold the truth of the gospel that, that it is not performance-based. It's not based on our merit, our worth, or our efforts. Rather, it is rooted in the work and the effort and the merit of Jesus. And so that's important because that's the part that kind of seems not congruent with the rest of the gospel and causes, like, is James contradictory here? And so James is not asserting that. So when we come to the heart of this letter, remember that James opposes false faith and false works. So James is opposed to faith without works, but he's also opposed to works without faith. James has already told us that, that we're saved by faith and faith alone. So he would uphold the truth of the gospel that is consistent throughout the entirety of scripture, specifically the New Testament. And James would uphold that we are saved by grace and grace alone, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And then he, he, he really is actually doubling down on that in this letter. So, so James's message is completely consistent and congruent with the rest of scripture. He's not coming at us now in chapter two and doing like a 180 and saying like, oh, by the way, the rest of the Bible is wrong. You're actually saved by all the good things that you do. He's already told us that we're saved by God's action first. So that's vital to keep in mind as we launch into this today. So, so what is James actually telling us? What's he getting at here through kind of the din of how he, how he says it? It's a little confusing. So, so really, when you look at verse 14, in some ways, James couldn't be, couldn't be clear, right? So look, look at what he says again. What, what good is it? Like, what substance is it? What, what value does it have? Like, what efficacy does this type of faith have? If a brother or sister, like if someone says to you that they actually claim faith, but it doesn't result in works, right? Can that, that cannot faith save them? This is, this is the central question, really, of the entirety of the letter of James. Um, it's designed to get us to ask, do I have a real and authentic faith? And this is important, okay? I think that James serves as a mere for us, like for me to look at, to, to examine and to dig into like my own heart. James, James, the letter of James isn't a mirror that we hold up, flip around and point at other people and accuse them of not having a faith. It's meant for us to, to, to read our hearts, to read us, and for us to do that hard and challenging work to say like, have we believed a full and robust gospel that does ultimately end with 
this action of works and, and, and doing good things. So, so that's the central question that James wants us to ask. It's for us to ask, do I have real faith or do I have the kind of like false faith that James is really warning against here. So, so he's saying there's a certain kind of faith that would, that would save us, right? Um, and, and what he means by that is that there's a certain kind of faith that, that saves us from God's coming wrath and judgment and separation from God. Um, and, and then he would also assert that there, there's actually a kind of faith that, that doesn't save us from God's coming wrath and judgment. And he, he gives this example in, in verse 15. Again, he, he kind of returns to this case study that he used um, previous here in chapter 2. And so let's look at that real quick. He says, if a brother or sister, and so I think James wants us to see, right, that, that this is somebody that you know, there's a familiarity. If not, maybe this person also asserts the same faith. Maybe they're a, a, a fellow follower of, of Jesus. Um, so if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, so, so he gives us an example and he says, hey, hey, if there's an impoverished person that, that you know, that you're familiar with, and they come to you, right, they're, they're, maybe they're vulnerable, um, they're disenfranchised, and, and, and they need protection and provision um, because they lack the basic necessities of life. They lack the structures of family or systems or community to support them that would result in their flourishing, um, James says we should pay attention to that. And, and now here's where we've kind of got to translate ourselves back into James's culture and day. Um, this is not somebody, so we need to understand this, James is not saying, hey, this is not just somebody that, that like merely needs, not that this isn't important, but needs like help with a power bill, right? Like that's important and that's necessary and that we should, we should help people um, in, in those type of situations. James is saying this is somebody who, who re like has the clothes on their back and that's it and they have nothing to eat for the rest of the day. And so what James wants us to see is that, that this person has now become kind of a victim of the system of their society. They, they are completely disenfranchised. They have nobody looking out for them anymore. And, and that's how this kind of literally gets translated from the original language, right? And so James says, this person comes to a community of Jesus followers and says, please help me. Notice that James is particular here in his word order. He says it's a brother or a sister. So the implication, this is, again, somebody that you're connected to. And James is asserting that, that God's people should pay special attention to those that are most vulnerable and exposed in their communities. And he, he's doing that by addressing the issue of poverty, right? But, but poverty and, and homelessness that exist because the individual no longer is incorporated into a family or into a community, that they no longer have a support system to, to assist them with provision and protection and access to help. Now listen, Hub City, I think we need to pay attention to what James is saying here. I think there's deep implications for what James is saying to us as God's people that we should uphold as a conviction the dignity and the value and the worth of God's image bearers. And specifically, we should promote and seek the flourishing of God's image bearers. And when we see somebody in our community that is vulnerable, that is disenfranchised, they're not incorporated into that system that is to, to provide and protect for them, then we should not merely assent to like some type of verbal acknowledgement of that. That's, that's good, um, but that's not enough. We should also take action. So I can't help but say this, Hub City, um, we should pay attention to this in the cultural moment that we're living in right now. And we should be able to, informed by the gospel, informed by James's letter, say we should be a people that recognize right now that we have fellow image bearers in our communities, in our lives, in our country that are not incorporated, that are disenfranchised, that the same system that protects and provides for us that may not be true for them. And so in good conscience, in good faith, in good like 
acting out and living out what it means to follow Jesus, we all day long should come alongside our black brothers and sisters in our country right now and not only support them with our words, but in our actions, right? We should declare that the lives and the culture and the reality of our fellow image bearers in our country that are black Americans more than matter. They are essential and vital to God's kingdom and are needed and necessary in our lives and in the life of the church. And so, so that should spur us to take action, to seek a place that creates a better story for our brothers and sisters. Like, I can't escape that. So, listen, I know some of you are going to have all sorts of questions about that. Please um, contact me. We can have more conversations about that. I'd love to sit down, but I just needed to say that. I need you to see that, that the gospel, which is James's letter to us, it's God's word to us, reveals to us today, right, that when, when somebody's vulnerable and marginalized, that that God's people come alongside them, right, and, and support and encourage and take action to seek justice for those that lack justice. Let's keep going here. James um, kind of goes on, right, um, and, and he, he, point, he point blanks says, right, and he does it kind of in, in this tricky ways. He says, like, listen, I, what I see is the church is, is failing, right? Because he says, look at verse 16. He says, um, this person comes to you and they say, like, I have needs, right? I, I, I'm, I'm not protected. I, I don't have provision in my life. And, and then one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, right? And James would say, those words in and of themselves are not enough, right? Well, and he's, cause he goes on and says, without giving them the things they needed for the body, what good is that? So he's saying to this community of Jesus followers, it's not enough to offer up nice sentiments and empty platitudes. Listen, as much as our warm thoughts and our prayers can go out to anybody, James would say, just simply saying our thoughts and prayers are with you or be warmed and filled, that's not enough, he says, and he pushes into this. Did you actually give them clothes? Did you give them what they needed for their bodies? Did you give them food? Did you actually take action? And so another way that maybe this could be translated is, is when, you, when you just express a sentiment, be warmed and filled, really what you're saying is, hey, may God help you because I certainly won't. Like, I'm not going to take action. I'll offer up a platitude, but, I, but it won't move me or force me to take action. So that's what's being said here by James in this case example. He's saying that this community is saying to this impoverished person, hey, be warm and be filled, and maybe God will help you, but we're not going to, right? So, so pay attention to this, right? Because he opens and closes this section with the same question. What good is it if you say you have faith? What good is it if you say be warmed and filled and do nothing? And, and his answer, like the expected answer is, that's no good. Like that's, that's meaningless. That, that's, that's what he tells us, right? And, and so what we need to see as we study James here is this. It is vital that the church cares for the impoverished people in our community and, and beyond that, right? Because that's just a case study. It's, it's important that we care for those that are disenfranchised, that are not incorporated, that, that are marginalized, that are pushed to the edge of our society, right? He says that it's vital that as a community of Jesus followers that we step into that brokenness, right? And, and seek a better story. So, he says that, that that really should be a basic part of any real living and active gospel community. So he says, do you want to know, right? Like, do you want to examine and find the actual truth? If you have genuine faith, like if, if what you claim to believe is actually true and has weight and is, uh, there's a, like an efficacy to it, what do you think about the poor? What, what do you think about the marginalized? What do you think about the least of these? And then, and then where in your life is there action towards them that would elevate and seek the flourishing of God's image bearers? So if we claim to be 
Jesus followers, and we never give a second thought about helping people who do not have as much as we have in terms of financial resources or material wealth, or, um, or if we just do that out of some sense of self-righteousness rather than the impetus being a gospel response, James says that our profession of faith is worth nothing. That's the test of faith that James gives us right off the bat, right? And then he goes and gives us like a very like general principle there in verse 17 to kind of close out this opening point. So he says, so also by or faith by itself, it, if it does not have works, it is dead. So there's just some important things there, right? So if you say that you have faith, so you have this like trust and belief in the faith of your like embodiment of the doctrines that you hold to and you have faith in that, but it doesn't actually result in actions, then that faith then is, is dead. So you, you have to see what he does. Here, here's the example, right? That um, he's saying that this kind of faith, um, the faith that just says, but never does is dead. Now you got to translate yourself back into that culture, put yourself into James's shoes, right? It's the first century. He's Jewish. He's writing this to um, primarily a Jewish audience. So he's writing to a place in a culture and a mindset that is so different from us. Um, you have to ask yourself this question. What, what did Jewish people of James's day avoid like the plague? Okay, maybe I could have worded that better, but, but, but what would they have never had anything to do with, right? The answer is this. They would have never had any contact with dead things or death because, because that made you unclean, that, that made you unrighteous, that made you, uh, put you into a place that you, you couldn't set foot in a synagogue, you couldn't set foot in a temple. So really what that means is that you were kind of excommunicated from your community if you interacted with dead things um, or, or death, you were unclean. And James is saying, if, if you merely profess without action in your life, you're like a dead corpse. So he's using like very strong language here. He wants to make his point like unavoidable to his readers. Um, and, and that really should bring us to the second point of what James is telling us. He's saying like, hey, tell us, like, like don't just say things, but actually show me, actually take action. So look at verse 18. He says, someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Now this is important. So he's creating two categories here. One person says, I have faith. The other person says, I have works. So show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And so, so here's what James did, because this is what we love to do. Like our brains and our emotions and thoughts, we always rush to like polarizing realities. We often pit things against each other that are meant to actually work in agreement with each other. So we default to like, like either or statements when James would want to see this or want us to see this as a both and kind of statement. So, so one person says, I have faith. The implication is I don't need works. The other person says I have works implication. I don't need faith. So that's that polarizing statement of either, or I have this, so I don't need this. And James wants us to see the, the, the relationship between faith and works is a both and right. He, he, James has a simple and really like kind of crushing reply to that, right? What, Cause what does he say? He says, well, show me, show me, show me that you have faith. He says, show me by, by doing. His message is simple and clear and, and we've got to get this straight in our minds. Good works do not save us, but good works that we perform, that flow out of our lives, that, that, are, that are a response to the gospel transformation that's occurring in us, they demonstrate that we have genuine faith. That's what James means when he says here, don't just tell me, show me your faith by your work, demonstrate the reality of that faith. And so for many professing Jesus followers today, good works are kind of an optional add-on. It's like an upgrade to an otherwise complete faith. Like, like if, if we get some good works done, okay, but if not, no big deal, because after all, we're saved by faith. So, so we, wanna, we wanna break it down to two things uh, when it's really just one. Remember, as, as we're gonna see here in, in a couple of weeks, James and Paul, which are 
often held against each other, they're actually in complete agreement on this point. It's not like Paul is the grace guy and James is the works guy. They're both on the same page. They're telling us the same thing. They both believe in the same gospel. And they would both uphold that genuine faith, which we are saved by faith through grace alone, um, demonstrates itself with good works. And a way to, to maybe look at your own life and examine your own heart to, to, to understand, is my faith genuine, is there should be evidence of good works in your life. And if there's not, you should really go back to the heart of what is my faith about. And so James gives us this second example here. He says this in verse 19. He says, you believe that God is one. Well, you do well, but, right, which is a good statement to believe that God is one. Um, but he says, even the demons believe and shudder. So, so I love this, right? Like James, James doesn't back off here. Like he kind of doubles down. He pushes deeper into this like kind of painful question for our hearts is, is our faith real? So here's what he's saying. He's saying that it is possible for us to have the right orthodox profession of faith to, to say and have all of the right beliefs, but actually not be saved. So he says, you believe that God is one. So, so that is a very loaded statement. That statement, you believe that God is one, he's referencing, it's a reference point um, for the nation of Israel. It's known as the great Shema, and, and it is the centerpiece of daily and morning and evening prayer for the people of Israel. It's considered by some to be one of the most essential prayers in all of Judaism, and it serves really as this kind of great centering and unifying statement for God's people. It's an affirmation of God's singularity and of his kingship and his authority. You can find it in Deuteronomy 6.4, and it, it, it reads just like this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So that's an affirming statement that the people of Israel would, would pray every day, and it centered them on what their faith, their body of doctrine was about. It's about the singularity or the oneness of God and his authority and his kingship and his kingdom. So there's an assent to a right and an affirmation of a right belief there. So James is looking at that person who says, like, I'm not like one of those people who don't believe because I believe, like my faith says, that I believe that God is one. And James says, if that's where you are, but there is no demonstrated reality of faith in your life, then your faith is on the same level of demons because demons believe that God is one also. And, and even further than that, he says, even the demons have the good sense to shudder at that, right? Even the demons get it enough to go, I should be afraid of the one true God. And so the implication here is that the person without works, that just has faith, but doesn't follow through with some type of good action, that faith is vapid and empty. James is saying that faith is about more than mere intellectual assent. If it doesn't result in a transformed heart and life, that it's not real, genuine faith. So if what you believe doesn't actually make you more like who you believe in, then it's not real. Let me say that again. If what you believe in doesn't actually make you more like who you believe in, then your faith is not genuine. So then the question becomes, if like this lands with us, if this kind of stings us a little bit, um, where, where is Jesus in this passage? Where's the gospel? Is, is this just James like rebuking us? Um, Jesus is, is right here because Jesus really becomes for us the exemplar, the, the perfect example of genuine faith. Like when you read about Jesus's ministry, it was a ministry of peach, preaching, so declaring, but also a ministry of works. It, it's, it was a ministry of saying and doing, right? Jesus, Jesus never sent an impoverished person away empty-handed. So, so Jesus never said, be warmed and filled without giving them exactly what they needed. Jesus becomes then this perfect example of a living and active and vibrant, transformed, gospel-centered faith. Jesus never said, it doesn't matter what you believe. All that matters is if you do your good works. On the other hand, Jesus never said, you know, it doesn't matter what you do. It just makes sure that your theology is all lined up. He said, you must have both to have genuine faith. So, so what about us? Like if you're like me, you read this passage and it probably convicts you because you're ashamed of how often you fail to have this kind of faith. 
right? And it presses in, it presses into the reality that now we love often our possessions more than we love giving them to the poor, or we love our way more than we love God's way. So, so what about us? Is there hope for us? Here's the gospel in this passage then. Here's the good news. The good news is this. If you come to Jesus empty-handed with all of your love of the things that you have and your, your possessions, more than giving them to the poor, and, and you're confronted with that, um, all of your love of yourself more than others, if you come to Jesus with that, Jesus will never send you away empty-handed. He will take that love of stuff and possessions and self away from you through the work of the gospel. And then he will fill you up with a genuine love and faith that spills out and over into others' lives. Like if you're going to follow Jesus, Jesus will build a great compassion and mercy and sense of justice into your heart because that's what he loves to do. And James really wants us to challenge ourselves to like, are we seeking a faith that only builds out a life of comfort for ourselves? Or do we build out a life and a faith that just like Jesus, who becomes our, not only our example, but our life to us, do we seek to give ourselves away to others in acts of mercy and compassion and justice to seek their flourishing? And the gospel would force us into a gospel that is living and active and transformative in our lives, does not look inward, looks outward and looks upward to God to produce that type of change in us. And so James is pressing into us and it should be challenging. Do we have a kind of faith that saves and a kind of faith that saves will be represented in our lives through our great acts of compassion and mercy and justice? And we need to acknowledge that we have received those from Jesus himself. So I hope that was helpful to you this morning, probably challenging in all sorts of ways. You probably have all sorts of questions about that. What I hope most is that it was convicting. It was God's word to you revealed. And now it creates in you this response. Like God reveals and we respond. And so this morning we're going to respond here and take some time as you sit at home um, and, and respond to the truth of God's word. Here's how we're going to do that this morning. We do it the same way as we do if we were here down at, at our space, which is we're going to encourage you to sing. And so there's going to be some songs that are going to come on. We would encourage you to take some time and to pray. We've got some prayers of response in there. We would ask that you would continue to give to Hub City, to the ministry of it, so that we can step into those hard and broken spaces and see where there's a lack of, and we can recognize that we've been blessed to be a blessing. And so um, we do that all the time at Hub City, and we do that in ways that are so beautiful. And so we, we, re we understand that, like, like you don't, you don't, you don't have to give because God, you know, needs it, um, but you give um, so that you can worship and you give so that we can uh, turn around and, and give that away and bless our city. And then finally, um, if you have some bread and some, some juice in your home, like take a second, go get that um, because we want you to, in, in your family, um, with your family, receive communion this morning. So let me pray um, and we'll get to responding. Father, we thank you for uh, this time together this morning. I pray that your word would come to full realization in our hearts and our lives, that we would be a people who seek justice, who seek compassion and mercy, that we would have a faith that is so real and vibrant and living and active that it results in this beautiful transformative work of your gospel and your kingdom being fully realized in our city as we come alongside those and bless others as we have been blessed. We thank you for this. In your name we pray. Amen.